Hello and thank you for watching. I'm Kieran Hanna from InsideIreland.ie and I'd like to welcome those who are joining us via the live stream or indeed those who are watching via catch up as you were. So you're all very, very welcome indeed. We are delighted to be back again as part of the Imagine Belfast Festival of Ideas and Politics. And it's great, there's actually a great lot, many um, journalism events as part of the 2022 festival. Last year's online event that, that we hosted uh, was looking at disinformation during the pandemic. You can find that on the Imagine Belfast YouTube page. This year's event was intended to be an in-person event, but we're grateful to the team at Accidental Theatre for, for moving us, uh, helping to move us on online to a, a virtual facility. And uh, this online event will be slightly shorter, but an hour or so. Uh, the topic of, of this year's event is, uh, is also one that's very much in the news, and it's that of online abuse. Now, in the Republic of Ireland, the Online Safety and Media Regulation Bill is currently before the door, and that aims to provide a means whereby hate speech and illegal content can be identified and quickly removed from online platforms. And it also is proposed that there would be a new regulatory authority, uh, the Irish Media Commission, to oversee this. Uh, over in the UK, uh, the Online Safety Bill has just recently been introduced into Parliament. And according to the British government, they say that the Online Safety Bill will require social media platforms, search engines and other apps and websites, allowing people to post their own content to protect children, tackle illegal activity and uphold their stated terms and conditions. And it's also proposed that the regulator Ofcom will have the power to fine companies failing to comply with the laws up to 10% of their annual global turnover and force them to improve their practices and block non-compliant sites. So that's all happening. Now, over in, in, in Northern Ireland, many commentators and, and, and politicians in particular have been subjected, unfortunately, to online abuse from, from trolls, particularly on the social media platforms. And some have tackled the issue head on. For example, the Alliance leader and, 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 and the Stormont Justice Minister Naomi Long has actually responded to some of her uh, trolls by posting a, a, a video itself, uh, tackling the issue head on, as, as it were. And unfortunately, earlier this year, the PSNI had to become involved after an anonymous Twitter account mocked the late son of DUP MLA Diane Dodds. The social media giant Twitter later performed a U-turn by stating the offensive tweet sent to Ms Dodds the original tweet did, after all, break the company's rules because previously it claimed that the original message did not break its safety policy. So then I had to overturn that and admit that it did. So that's sort of the framework for today's debate. What is online abuse? How pernicious is it? How does it manifest itself uh, here on, on these aisles? What are the experiences of those who, who suffer with endless trolling and, and why are they particularly targeted? What can be done to prevent it, if at all? So other questions, we're obviously not going to deal with it thoroughly uh, today, but just to scratch the surface of this debate. And to do that, we've assembled a very impressive panel of experts on this issue. So uh, let's meet them now in alphabetical order. Uh, we did... <sighs> He, we may not be able to have him. He, he dropped out there. So we, we'll see if he's with us. Uh, Mick Fieldy is a journalist and the founding editor of the acclaimed website, Sluggo Tool. He has written papers on the impacts of the internet on politics and the wider media. Uh, hello, Mick. Uh, are you with us? Perhaps. I, I hope I am. <laughs> you certainly are, sir. Good evening. You're very welcome, sir. Thank you very much for joining us. Amanda Ferguson is a Belfast-based freelance journalist and commentator who has experience of, of these issues. Uh, hi, Amanda. Hello, thank you for having me. It's wonderful to, to have you on the panel. Uh, Kieran O'Connor is an analyst at the Institute for Strategic Dialogue, the ISD, working in the Research and Policy Unit. Uh, hello, Kieran. Hello, everyone. And Dr. Orna Young co-founded Northern Ireland's first and so far only fact-checking organisation, in 2015, fact check and I, and hello to you, Anna. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for having me. So a very, very warm welcome uh, to the panel. Uh, now, just to, for us to start off, uh, Kieran has very kindly produced uh, uh, some slides to help sort of put the, this issue into some sort of context and some facts and figures. 
So, Kieran, I'll hand over to you, and I want to thank you very much indeed for the work that you put into this for us. Thanks very much, Kieran. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Kieran O'Connor, and I'm a yeah disinformation and extremism researcher uh, with ISD, as mentioned, uh, based in London. The think tank is based in London. I'm based in Ireland, and uh, they monitor and analyze disinformation, extremism, hate, harassment um, online. So this evening, uh, I want to talk to you about uh, online abuse. Um, just want to make sure my slides are showing up there. Um, uh, we're going to present some. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so my particular focus is on extremism and how it manifests online in the form of hatred, abuse and harassment. Uh, I'll share some insights from my work and the work of my colleagues uh, in this field to give you a sense of what online abuse and misogynistic abuse looks like, which I'm sure we're all sadly familiar with to varying degrees, uh, but also share some of the underlying mechanisms and practices on social platforms that create uh, permissible spaces for extremism and abuse and, and create safe spaces uh, to hate. So first of all, it's important to define uh, what is extremism and what does it look like? Um, we, what we mean by extremism is important because in different countries there are legal jurisdictions, there are different definitions and potential legal implications. Radical right-wing activity in Germany is not deemed illegal, but extremist right-wing activity is, for example. Uh, very quickly, extremism is the advocacy of the superiority or dominance of one of the in-group uh, overall out-groups, and it's really that uh, othering that comes through a dehumanization process um, that is that defines the potential act of, of extremism. One way that this is manifested online is through hate speech, which we define as uh, the use of language or online actions to attack people based on their characteristics, including ethnicity, uh, religious, um, religious affiliation, sexual orientation uh, or disability, and of course, gender. Uh, online, we see extremism and abuse and hatred play out in different ways. Um, one area I focus on a lot is right-wing extremism and how it manifests into promoting hatred of others, that othering process uh, based on these attributes. Um, often, first of all, due to, to race. Uh, Ethno-nationalism is a constant, best encapsulated by this Ireland for the Irish or England for the English kinds of phrasing that defines Ireland in this instance as a, as a monocultural nation for white Irish people only. Uh, the belief is then demonstrated in reactions or sentiments towards housing rights, healthcare, or of course, immigration, and most recently, uh, COVID-19. Uh, this is replicated all across European nations, global nations in different ways, all serving to articulate some form of us the natives versus them, uh, the foreigner or the invader or these kinds of uh, phrases. Uh, broadly, such communities support nationalism and nativism. They engage in racism against minorities in the state. They support xenophobia and even authoritarianism in some corners. Uh, narratives and myths are essential to right-wing extremist ideology and community formation and are the tools uh, used by these communities to express their beliefs, to try and frame events or developments in a way that supports uh, these beliefs. Uh, narratives that address emotional needs more than ideological ones often uh, perceived hardships that members of the in-group face uh, can be framed as a consequence of the actions of the out-group. Um, but the state uh, or, or actions of minorities are often the, the blame here. And the narratives also offer solutions to these problems, and that is join us, support us, become one of us to uh, act out against your grievances. Uh, we see far-right expressions of hatred and abuse against women in the form of total rejection of feminism, the perception of this as the total opposite of what is traditionally expected of women, and misogyny and gender-based slurs, abuse and expressions of hatred are all common to uh, particularly those um, marginalized people as well. Um, so then to talk about some of the research that myself and my colleagues have put out, uh, last year we researched Irish far-right communities online and specifically uh, the use by these communities of the online platform Telegram. Uh, in 2020, Irish far-right groups, uh, influencers, supporters made Telegram one of their primary online platforms. Uh, quick numbers for you. In 2019, there was a handful of Irish far-right channels on the platform and they posted just over 800 messages according to our analysis. Fast forward to 2020, 
This had increased to 34 channels who posted over 60,000 messages. So going from 960,000 in the space of one year, Telegram became the home and is the home of the Irish far right right now. As part of this research, we looked at a number of case studies uh, looking at incidents in which the Irish far right tried to muddy the waters, tried to use these events for their own means to uh, promote and, and post racist, uh, harmful and offensive narratives, one of which we looked at was the fatal shooting of George and Kensho in December 2020 and the immediate reaction online. And um, when you looked at the Irish far right reaction to this event, within hours of the shooting, uh, Irish far right telegram channels were sharing clear instructions to their members on how best to react to the shooting, to stir up racial tensions and using disinformation as a way to target hatred and target abuse towards the, the black Irish uh, community. Fab fabricated claims about Kensho and his family regarding his history were common. There was claims that he had a criminal record. You may remember the false claim that Kensho had 32 criminal convictions, which originated on these kinds of spaces before making its way to the more kind of uh, normal and kind of mainstream spaces on Facebook and on Twitter. And beyond Nkensho, this, used, uh, this was used as a kind of gateway to target black the black Irish community, framing protests as BLM, as Black Lives Matter terrorists, for example. Um, one of the, the second case study we looked at was the appointment of Roderick O'Gorman as the Minister for Children in the Republic. Uh, O'Gorman is a gay man. And what happened here very quickly was that these far-right groups on Telegram used the uh, O'Gorman sexuality as a, as a megaphone for attacks against the wider LGBTQ community, uh, providing a space for channels to post homophobic content and amplify conspiracy theories against him and against the wider community as well. Um, and the smear campaign acted as an entry point, which often is what you see these kinds of groups use one incident as a way to uh, open the gates and allow other claims and other um, slurs to enter as well. And this will happen in this instance. Um, what started as an online campaign against O'Gorman culminated in, a, in a, a July rally in Dublin targeting LGBTQ groups by far right groups and entities, including the National Party, who marched with banners uh, with nooses on the banner saying against to protect the children, this idea of saving uh, the children. Um, some more other research I've put out um, is looks at TikTok as a platform. It's incredibly popular. It's, it skews younger, of course, but it is, is, it is highly popular amongst all age groups. When we consider how extremism and hatred proliferates online, accessibility and ease with which platforms allow users to spread and create hate is also an important factor. Uh, last year, I released a report examining the state of extremism and hate speech on TikTok. TikTok has a reputation as a space for cooking videos and dance trends, and that is it is those things, but it also has over 1 billion users, which means there's a lot more than that as well. Um, we, we aim to address the knowledge gap on how unique aspects of TikTok are used at scale to direct hatred at others. And we found that videos uh, and, 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 and content actively expressing support for extremism and other forms of hatred, including misogyny, are easily discoverable on TikTok and is often allowed to remain on the platform, making it uh, a safe space to hate. Uh, coded and veiled, veiled keywords are a popular tactic of extremists online. The use of emojis amongst hateful actors is a popular way of developing in-jokes and a secret language of sorts amongst extreme right-wing circles, for example, lightning bolts and um, male emojis with a raised right arm are popular ways of expressing your, your support for white supremacist, neo-Nazi ideologies, this kind of thing. So what we mean by this is then that platforms make it easy to spread hate. Uh, another popular part of TikTok is all the effects and filters that they offer creators to allow people to make what are creative and technically impressive videos without needing the, the requisite skills to do so. But in this instance, we, we see a lot of people using these kinds of skills and, 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 and techniques to create hated videos and create videos that target minorities based on these uh, un, un, unmutable and, and unmistakable uh, kind of attributes. So platforms make it uh, easy to spread hatred and apps like TikTok offer a suite of editing tools like that. And just to show you a couple of examples very quickly of the, the, the content that was captured in this uh, research, on the top left is an extremist user who posted a video and, and on the left is the video that he added. Um, it's a clip or it's a photo of the Unabomber Ted Kaczynski who notoriously rejected modern society and lived as a recluse in the woods of Montana. Uh, here, Kaczynski 
Kandinsky's ethos of rejecting modern society was referenced as a way of rejecting what is represented in the other video, which is a clip of plus size women celebrating body positivity, uh, something that this online user sees as a negative and is using the image and the kind of ideology of Ted Kaczynski to spread hatred against these women. Bottom left is a video of military footage which this user imagines as showing the targeting of an abortion clinic. It's pretty on the nose. And on the right is a, is a black Irish woman speaking about racism in the aftermath of the George and Kensho shooting. Though here, the user stitched this woman's video and added their own, which was a clip of a person uh, spouting various uh, slur words against, against black Irish and black people in general. And then um, lastly, just to talk about um, some real research from my colleagues. Uh, this is a report, Public Figures, Public Rage, from my colleagues Cecile and Isha. Uh, research undertaken to analyze the scale and nature of online abuse targeting congressional candidates uh, during the 2020 US presidential campaign. So it's, it's, it's from the States. Uh, some of the key findings, women are unsurprisingly far more likely than men to be abused on Twitter with abusive messages making up more than 15% of the messages directed at every female uh, compared to 5 or 10% for male candidates. Uh, women of ethnic minority backgrounds are particularly likely to face online abuse. And really what this report shows was the limits of self-regulation and self-reporting by social media companies in dealing uh, with harmful content online. This is something that we'll probably get into a little bit later and more. Instead of focusing on determining the legitimacy or not of individual pieces of content, uh, they should concentrate on the systems, design choices and decisions that are in place to govern the online information uh, environment, which is currently so hospitable to hatred and harassment. And, 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 and lastly, the, the, the big recommendation of this report was that uh, democratic governments should pursue regulation that moves away from siloed content-based rules, attempting to address each type of illegal activity or breach of rights separately towards something that is more systematic, more transparent, and puts more power in, in, the, in the hands of users and in the hands of, of civil society organizations um, as well. And I have one more slide, but I don't think we need it. It was just talking about COVID-19 and how this kind of becomes a new arena for, for abuse and, ex and conspiracies and disinformation. We can get into that later on. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Kieran. That's um, pretty... <laughs> Shocking, I suppose, in some ways, but I suppose it's 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 not given that people have unfortunately experiences of this. Um, I go now to to Dr. Orna Young. Uh, Orna, I don't know if any, yeah, if you have come across any uh, similar st statistics in the research that you've done. Well, thank you, Kieran, and thank you, Kieran, for that presentation. Um, it's so interesting um, and kind of reflects a lot of the work. Um, we at Fact Check and I have been doing over recent years. Um, we were actually born out of, um, I suppose, uh, rumours and misinformation and disinformation in Northern Ireland or the North of Ireland specifically. Um, and the kind of dynamic of abuse online has always kind of informed why we do what we do and how it kind of, I suppose, projects itself or uh, presents itself in the context of the North of Ireland or North of Northern Ireland. Um, so I think that uh, everything Kieran was saying absolutely speaks to what we do. Do. And I think it's important to kind of, I suppose, what I'll try and do a little bit here, Kieran, is probably kind of pan out a little bit and then pan in. So I'm, I'm going to discuss it from a very much a, a fact checking or fact checker perspective, um, because we are dealing with a lot of this um, and not only in terms of uh, the North or Northern Ireland, but indeed globally as a community of fact checkers um, and those, whether they be content creators of fact checks or indeed journalists. So. I think it's really important to actually kind of, um, I suppose, and then I'll give a little bit of my personal viewpoint, having, I suppose, fact-checked a pandemic um, and many elections uh, and that type of stuff. So I suppose in terms of online abuse, I think it's important to, uh, I suppose, it's, it, this is great that something like this has actually been spoken about and an event like this, because when we look at the kind of, I suppose, proliferation of how many people are actually online um, in terms of that, so it's something like 95% of young people have social media accounts of some sort. As Kieran just mentioned, and TikTok. I feel a little bit old for TikTok. I just think I'm out of the realm of it. Maybe for salads and stuff, that would be about the height of it. Um, but I suppose from our perspective and my professional hat on, uh, for me, online abuse is, is its most damaging and problematic, I suppose, when it's damaging public debate. Um, so it's limiting people, it's limiting participation, and it makes people not want to be uh, involved in discussions that are very much important to them. 
So, for example, like Karen used the example of women, and I'll come back to that in a minute. I could probably wax lyrical about that all night. But it's important to say that online abuse is also a scale. So we see that ourselves. Um, I see that as an individual online. I see it as a person with my professional hat on that, you know, there are you have your kind of very low level inverted commas trolls. But then you have people that it's much more damaging and effectively dangerous, I would say. You know, Karen spoke a lot to the extremists. Um, uh, and, and we see people within our realm and within our orbit and people I see online all the time dealing with this type of thing. And it's important to say that there is that overlap between, uh, and Kieran articulated that super well, you know, that overlap between online abuse and hate crime, because one doesn't happen in a vacuum. You know, they both feed each other. The, the discourse and narrative around this stuff is really, really important. It fosters an environment of hostility to particular groups uh, and people. And we see in, in terms of a UK context, whether it be North of Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland, we're seeing efforts to kind of, I suppose, mitigate this. Um, you know, we have, uh, but the problem with a lot of these things, and I'll be really honest about it, uh, speaking with a professional, a lot of this stuff is very, very vague. You know, we're only really getting to grips with a lot of this stuff now. Um, you know, we have new anti-harassment offences where, where if you send something that is, you know, knowingly false communications, uh, which uh, intentionally cause non-trivial emotional, psychological or physical harm. Now, unpack that for the person on the street and what that means. And that's a very different thing. Um, so it, those kind of vague terminology were not necessarily helpful to my mind. Um, and also we need to talk about, um, and Kieran touched on it towards the end there, was you know, what are internet companies going to do? We have fact check and I work on the uh, Facebook, Facebook third party fact checking programme. So we've kind of an idea of what uh, platforms are trying to do. We're part of the International Fact Checking Network, who are in talks. We, we deal with Google. Uh, we do. We've written, you know, kind of an open letter to YouTube. Um, we know that, and we've also ourselves at Fact Check and I worked with the European Commission on tools to mitigate kind of mis and disinformation. Uh, you know, kind of electronic tools. But this is. Um, I suppose, within the wider context, I suppose, of um, how um, you can balance that with freedom of expression. I know, I know we're going to get into that later, so I'm not going to get good, kind of loaded, uh, lay it on thick here, um, but also within the context of what's been developed in the online safety bill. Now, we've seen that kind of evolve in front of our eyes. And I know you mentioned in the intro there, Kieran, which was really, really helpful. Um, and, you know, the scope of that bill and how it has changed and evolved, we've been watching with great interest um, because the idea of the UK being the same safest place to be on, uh, go online in the world or whatever the terminology they're using um, is it, it, quite the assertion, number one. And number two, when you go on and you see how uh, UK and Ireland, how people are behaving online and that, that, that that's going to take a lot of work. And the, the actual bill itself is critiqued for being too vague and also not putting enough protections in, in terms of freedom of expression, which is ironic given the fact that as a fact checker, you would think that I would, you know, maybe be uh, on the line of no, you know, mute, mute, or, you know, kind of uh, take the stuff off. And also we need to have a conversation about automation. So if we're saying to, uh, I suppose, internet companies, yes, go create the algorithms, get this stuff offline, this abuse. We're telling them to do that. You know, how do we get inside and understand how they're creating those things? What tech is, go you know, kind of what's influencing those decisions, what policies? Uh, and I think that, that that's that's concerning to me, not only in terms of with my professional hat on, but as an individual. And I think we definitely need more transparency. I know we'll all have that discussion in the end. But if we're to say into internet, you know, internet companies and social media platforms, go and create these algorithms but we're not asking for the transparency, the methodology behind it. That's a problem. Um, and I think there needs to be a much bigger discussion because I think we've really shut down a lot of discussion around the idea of freedom of expression by saying people, you know, all you have to do now is someone says they're cancelled and we're having a, it's shutting down important conversations that need to happen. And I think it's important just to give a, an idea of our experience um, quickly in terms of a fact check and I, um, you know, we've seen it all in terms of that kind of idea that, you know, people just disagree with your work, you know, and I'm sure I can speak to the two other journalists here and Kieran indeed with his research and stuff. People disagree with you. That's kind of the scale of it, right? But the problem is when people are orchestrating pylons, they misrepresent your organisation or indeed, you know, you as an individual, they can defame, you know, team members um, and that can become physical and legal in nature. So that's the reality of what being a fact checker or a journalist indeed, I'm sure Amanda can speak to that and Mick indeed. Um, and I think what is really interesting for me to watch uh, and have watched particularly over the last two years 
is that the kind of levels of abuse we're getting is dependent on our output and on any given day. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful example of confirmation and disconfirmation bias. We can be flavor of the month one day and then the same kind of people who would have been piling on on us, you know, two days earlier will be sharing our work. But internationally, this has serious implications. You know, we know from uh, the International Fact Checking Network that, you know, there's fact checkers, you know, receiving death threats. Um, and we've also seen the coordinated and absolutely um, and a lot of what Kieran was speaking there in terms of the far right um, uh, tra it transcends borders in terms of the health disinformation that has been out there. Um, and there is a really thin line between online abuse and that kind of deliberate disinformation whose agenda under what we always say to people from Fact Check and I is like, who's where has this come from that you're sharing like well, what is the agenda under underneath that if you dig down a little bit deeper and so we have you know that that, that idea of you know we've had groups that are, are keen to expose us as fact checkers in terms of the, and the type of abuse and as I said earlier orchestrating pylons that type of thing um, but the reality is we're not part of some like hidden um, cohorts that are trying to you know brainwash people into thinking the way we do and so all we can do is be as transparent uh, with our methodology and our sources and the data and the evidence we're using. Um, and, and that's really important to us. COVID-19, um, as Kieran touched on towards the end, was borderless, as I said. Um, a lot of the myths and disinformation and the associated abuse, I think that's really important to say that, that a lot of um, uh, what we received abuse-wise was very much international. It wasn't um, uh, local uh, for, for the most part. It was very much international and part of a much bigger kind of agenda. Um, and th that isn't going to be fixed by what I was talking earlier. Those online safety bills, those things, this, this, is this is a much bigger conversation we need to be having because there are things like we have have you know we've observed you know and I'm sure others have to the nature of that kind of automated trolling that goes on in terms of bots um, and there is a, a tendency I think in Northern Ireland or the north of Ireland to kind of caricature online trolls these like faceless you know you know Orna not one two three four five six seven eight accounts I actually don't think that's necessarily the case for a lot of it in terms of online abuse and the nature of abuse particularly to this particular to this region um, I see a lot of blue tick accounts actually uh, orchestrating a lot of this stuff um, or in certainly um, uh, what would I say magnifying particular takes on things that uh, result in the hounding of individuals or groups or organisation and sort of in effect directing this type of stuff so I think it's it's important to note that this isn't you know as I said at this at the top that it's not just a thing about uh you know a small number of people that are receiving abuse it's it's huge in volume and it's it, it's it's omnipresent but it's also to say that it isn't the um I suppose the gift of these obscure Twitter accounts or these obscure TikTok accounts it's often very well known people um and I think it's important that we need to I suppose from my point, the, the best, the number one thing we can do to counter this kind of behaviour is not only like expose it, but uh, and, and, and elevate it. So I, I see particularly women journalists and politicians in, in the North or Northern Ireland dealing with this day in, day out. Um, they literally have to go on a radio show for 10 minutes and they're accused of being shrieky and the language we're using. So I actually think it's really important. And actually I've, I've made a mindful a decision mindfully myself to uh, I suppose kind of go actually call it out when you see it. And I think that's transparency and uh, emphasising is important. Uh, just on on the point, and I'll I'll, I'll, I'll stop now um, because I realise I could probably sit on this platform for ages talking about this. Um, I, I completely agree with Kieran, and I'm so I so welcome seeing work on this kind of idea of what you know has been termed network network misogyny um, because it is such a feature of my my professional life online, but also as a, an individual watching it happen to other women and particularly women who maybe don't, you know, are, are you know, from ethnic minorities or, um, speak, you know, kind of are, 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 feel mar, are marginalised and experience marginalisation online. And I think we need to have another conversation about where the line lies between hate speech and incitement uh, from a lot of these bigger accounts as well, because um, it, it's driving people kind of away. And I, I think it's really important that we have those um, 
the, the, those things. Things we do. So, you know, for example, if as an organization we see, receive a lot of abuse, I think it's really important just to stick to your normal tone um, in terms of the pylons we would have received in relation to COVID and things like that. Um, it, you often find these mega groups kind of lose interest, actually, that kind of far right element lose interest. Um, uh, and it's good to see that actually people are, you know, we talked about at the top, you know, kind of politicians in the North and Northern Ireland or Northern Ireland, uh, you know, um, sharing their experiences. And I think that's a really powerful tool because I think we need to humanise each other online. You know, Kieran talked about the dehumanisation and the othering. And I think that it's it's incumbent upon us all with any platform whatsoever to kind of, I suppose, challenge us in whatever way we can. So thank you. Thank you very much, Sharna, for putting all that into the context for us. Uh, Mick Field has just recently written an article uh, on Slugger of the Tool about this. Mick, I'd be interested in your thoughts, given just what, what we've heard and what you've just basically written about. It seems to some sort of the similar themes as to what you've touched upon in your article. Yeah, well, I'm going to reflect on uh, some of that, some of what I've written in the article. Um I mean, just a little bit of background for me. I, I set Slugger up about 20 years ago uh, as a research resource, not as a journalist. Uh, and I've never claimed to be a journalist. I'm much more much more of an instinct of a, of a researcher rather than a, an out-and-out -out journalist saying what the news is every day. Now, for a time, Slugger was very much a journalistic tool because... Prior to Twitter turning up, we were able to break news rel relatively easy because we could get a hold of uh, breaking stories. And by the time the BBC or UTV had managed to get it out for the five o'clock news, we'd put something out quickly. And that became, that became for a time, I think, Slugger stock, stock in, uh, in trade. Uh, but right from the very beginning, I think some of my earlier experiences um, working in the arts made it absolutely clear to me that if we were going to build a conversational space, it had to have rules of engagement. And I, I think it goes back to a much earlier experience that I had working in a, a participatory art form in which it was uh, really dinned into me that if you want to create something of value, then you have to create a structure around which people can create valuable and generative insights. Um, and, and I guess, really, when Slugger started, the first thing that we went to was this idea of playing the ball and not the man. It, it's a kind of a simple cultural rule that doesn't interfere too much with people's ability to uh, express freely, but denies them the license to say whatever they bloody well like. And I think uh, if we go back to Marshall McLuhan's uh, genius kind of analysis of television back in the 1960s that the medium is the message what's happened uh i think first of all with the blogs that but then latterly uh, uh, at a huge scale with twitter facebook those are my two kind of uh poisons if you like but also i think tiktok um is is that we have created this vast wasteland where there is absolutely no uh rules of engagement whatsoever I, and, and actually, while we're touching on the, um, you know, Karen's brought it in, Orna's uh, uh, mentioned it again, and I'm sure Amanda's got something to say about this too. But there is a great feminist es essay from, I think, the very early uh, 1970s that talks about the tyranny of structurelessness. And I, I think very much what we have allowed in the West, and I'm not particularly talking about Northern Ireland, we suffer from it too, but it's, it's, it's a much broader phenomenon, is that we have allowed these structureless uh, behemoths, uh, global monopolies, to come in and basically conduct all our political discourse, all our personal discourse. Because remember, you know, uh, we, we know TikTok trends young. Kieran's pointed that out. out. And it's, it's not just in politics that it's creating distress. Young women are judging themselves against other women, who, uh, young women, who are using filters to project a body image that's not true, not real. Um, I've mentioned in the piece that I've written on Slugger that, you know, uh, the, these platforms now mean that um, the gossip chains that we all remember from our days at school you know, they're, they're wounding, uh, they push individuals into isolation. But these days it doesn't even end with the school holidays because 
when you get back in September, it used to be like, where did you go? What were you doing? All the rest. Kids already know where their mates have been during the holidays and they have a version of what they did before that kind of actually gets to speak on their own behalf in their own uh, situation. So this structurelessness, this license, if you like, to uh, ascribe context to someone else's words, actions, deeds, as captured by uh, in fragments by these uh, platforms, I think that's the that's the real problem. Um, and the problem also is the 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 degree of pers- participation levels. I mean, twenty years ago, really, you had to be two things to read a political blog. You have to be politically obsessed and a bit nerdy and a bit geeky, which actually meant you were in a kind of a small group of people who uh, really understood, uh, you know, well, had access to the internet and then, um, uh, you know, uh, knew how to, uh, knew how to uh, access, uh, you know, access these particular forums. CompuServe forum is one, that I uh, commented on in the in the early nineties, and that got me re-engaged with Northern Irish politics. Um, but now everybody's on there, and everyone is commenting, and everyone has an opinion, and everybody else thinks everybody else is wrong, and and it's it's this kind of great tumult. I mean, yes, I I, I see the work, and I value the work that. Uh, um, Karen's doing on uh, exp- extremists, but I think it applies to all of us. You know, Jaron Lanier wrote a great book, 10 Arguments for Why You Should Delete Your Social Media Accounts Right Now. And one of the, I kid you not, one of the chapter headings, the chapter headings are brilliant, they're genius, they're very easy to read, and you probably got a synopsis of the book. What One of the chapter headings is social media is turning you into an asshole. And when you read that, and it says it's an accusatory thing. It's saying it's turning all of us into assholes because it's the it's the first thing that you go to. It is uh, uh, emotionally fed, and I think that's a really important comment from uh, Kieran there when he said that many of these groups um, cater for the emotional needs of the in group, not the out group. Uh, but we're all in some form of in group, uh, and 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 for me, it is beginning to give rise to this dominance of an expressive individual or an individualism that really doesn't care about society, doesn't care about women, doesn't care about welfare. And unfortunately, because we've allowed these platforms to go mainstream in terms of how we report back to our friends and family um, and communities and wider society, um, many of these voices, these dissident lost individuals are being given a currency that really they don't deserve. Um, so, um, you know, I, I guess I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to finish because uh, I, I know we need to save some time for uh, uh, other questions and for conversation between the panel. But, but for me, the, the participation in these emotionally driven conversations um, where you know, the oh, shiny cat gif kind of mentality uh, is is leading us away from those deeper, serious conversations that are often about problems that are difficult to describe and therefore difficult to resolve. Things like, in the context of Northern Ireland, poor investment strategies, uh, sinking productivity, which is, which is a problem right across the world, and stagnant wages, which is one of the things that's driving this uh, this, this I, it's almost like it's kind of reproducing itself. So our inability to look at some of the serious structural issues that are making people poorer and angrier is just creating more timber uh, uh, f- for the fire. I think we've got to find a way, not simply of regulating, but finding ourselves again, not just as individuals, but people who have a commonality of interest that, 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 that can uh, don't have to all agree who or what we are, but do have to agree to consent at least to do uh, solve some of these bigger problems uh, in some way together. So I don't see the technology. This technology is creating an, uh, the problem. The business models, I think, of Facebook and Twitter and anything else that you use for free is problematic because it is using uh, and making millions and billions uh, out of out of human anger. That's the thing we have to address, and I think we have to address it in our our own our, our own lives first. In not taking many of these platforms as seriously as we've come to. 
And Thanks. Thank you, uh, Mick. Uh, Amanda, I think the, the explanations from Orna and and Kieran about the, the motivations of some of these people who troll and, and indulge in online abuse would come of no surprise to you, I think, unfortunately. Well, certainly, I just want to start by saying that I really like the online world. I enjoy it. The, the vast majority of people who are communicating with me are dead on or they're interesting or they're kind or they're funny um, and the communication with them is positive. It is a minority of people that are engaged in, in this kind of disrespectful uh, online behaviour that just wouldn't fly in the real world and we have to remember that it isn't the real world and I think that you know I've been a journalist since about 2009-10 and at that point I had Facebook I think from about 2007 and then I joined Twitter in 2009 um, and it became a really effective tool for my journalism because I have a theory that you'll find an Irish person from either jurisdiction in the centre of every single story, no matter where it's taken place in the world. Uh, so it was useful in, in terms of the, the start of my journalistic career. Uh, Twitter felt like a, a softer, sort of kinder place um, in those in those years when I started using it. You know, I remember the, the Follow Friday hashtag where people would recommend, you know, nice accounts uh, to follow when people would thank each other, you know, for recommending them to other people. But I think that um, what's happened with journalism for me is that whenever I was writing something in the paper, uh, if someone didn't like it, they could write a letter to the editor or write to the letters pages or they could phone the newsroom, which they uh, frequently did, or they would write me letters or postcards uh, and all the rest of that stuff. But the more that um, my following grew online and the more that I started doing broadcast work, the more uh, intense uh, online abuse and, and trolling became. And there's a range of, of topics that seem to trigger uh, the sort of people that you would uh, cross the road to avoid in real life. And I've just written a wee list, so I'll, I'll look down. We've got feminism, uh, women's rights, sexism, domestic violence. Um, sport seems to trigger uh, people, particularly when women talk about it. Brexit, uh, covid uh, all that misinformation, disinformation around COVID, just the insatiable appetite for information about the pandemic, uh, and then also all the the sort of bad shit uh, responses to it as well. Uh, politics in general uh, seems to be something that triggers people, uh, and a really random one is seafood. People seem to be triggered by seafood if uh, they seem to think that you're showing off if you um, want to eat something more than fish fingers. Um, and I noticed that there's a surge in this kind of behaviour, particularly locally, uh, if I've done broadcasting, if I have been on the radio or on TV within sort of five uh, minutes of, of being online, uh, this is uh, the sort of stream of misinformation and misrepresentation about what I've said will happen, uh, you know, personal in insults, uh, libel, uh, you know, the, the full works there. So at this point, I have about 3,000 accounts blocked and about 1,000 uh, muted, but that is a small percentage of the number of people that I engage with online. And I think one of the problems is that the internet really is the Wild West. You know, it is, uh, there's no regulation, there's no accountability, um, you know, anything kind of goes. And there's lots of dark corners uh, on the on the internet, uh, you know, often a, an instrument uh, of the patriarchy as well. So I think that um, the flavour of abuse that I get would mainly be misogynistic. The root of it is 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 because I'm a woman. Um, then there will be a lot of sectarian uh, abuse and anti-Irish sentiment as well. Um, and really just if, if uh, you express an opinion about something, that seems to be the, the most upsetting uh, for these kind of uh, online trolls or, or scumbags. And uh, Orna is right, it isn't always just anonymous, faceless number accounts. It's people who are in the public domain, some people who have a media platform uh, and so on. And that and that is is one of the worrying things. And I think that the... The response to online abuse from the social media platforms just isn't good enough. You know, they don't, it doesn't appear to, to be a human that looks at, um, at, the, at what you're reporting. And I don't think that they understand context, um, which is, you know, something that you're taught in week one in journalism school. So um, it is definitely an issue, but it, it is um, it is the minority of the, the contacts that I have. So I, I think that what we, we heard earlier in the conversation is that uh, some of this gets more... Um, of a focus and more of a spotlight than it actually deserves. It's the same as as, as those kind of extreme opinions that are platformed uh, in debates. You know where you're where an expert in a field is is pitted against somebody who's read something on Facebook. And I think that that, that balance issue um, contributes to all this as well. But I don't want um, to to sort of say that 
uh, you know, the internet's the worst thing that's ever happened in the world. I think that it's a tool for good, but it's the same with anything. If something is is there uh, as something positive, there'll be people who use it uh, negatively as well. Is there anything that surprises you still, or uh, obviously the fish fingers of the seafood thing? But uh, is there is there anything um, that surprises you with the nature of the of the, or, or do you think that you've probably seen it's everything? Kind of like, now? At this point, it's kind of water off ducks back. You know, whenever it certainly upsets my family, it upsets my mother. Uh, you know, so I try not to to show her uh, the worst of it. Um, I think you know it, it, it does feel like harassment at certain points. You know, I've had to consult police and uh, lawyers about some of the content that's gone online about me, and it doesn't seem to be as if there's any straightforward way to get it to stop. You know, you, you can try uh, complete silence. You can try uh, you know magnifying it. Uh, you can try sort of responding back. You know, taking the piss out of it or, or whatever else. Um, and nothing seems to to make it stop. And I think that some of the tools uh, that happen that that are online, um, for example, on Twitter, uh, if you have an account blocked, they're still able to use your account name in their posts, which highlights the the troll army. Uh, so even if you can't see what they've said or you've you sort of muted that out or away, then it triggers uh, other people to come to your timeline with further. Uh, abusive um, sort of commentary and I make no apologies at all for the, the number of accounts that I have blocked online you know some people seem to raise this issue but you're a journalist you know it means you don't believe in free speech and I'm like of course I believe in free speech but I also believe in my right not to be abused uh, online and um, I think that people do it because they can and I don't think that the internet has um created uh, abusive people. I just think it's given people who were already abusive uh, another platform to do it on. Uh, you talked about the, the the tool of magnifying it. And for me, who, who sort of goes under the radar of things, and also because I'm a man, I think, as, as well. So I, I, I have no... Uh, you know, experience of this at all. So it was only when you sort of, you know, re retweeted the kind of abuse that you did get. I found that personally very shocking. Um, yeah, well, this, yeah. this is the thing. Like, you do, you do, um, I've, been, I've been through different phases. Sometimes I go through phases of just completely ignoring it, com not giving it any oxygen uh, whatsoever. And that can work to an extent, but it doesn't stop it from happening. Other times um, I will screenshot it or uh, do a sequence of slides to show people the sort of thing that's happening. And, you know, then you're caught in the, oh, is this, is this you looking for attention or are you looking for pity or, you know, uh, you know, toughen up and, and those sort of things. So you can't can't really win no, no, no matter what you do but um uh, there are times where it does feel like harassment um and that's something that i that i have highlighted and that does concern me because it's not necessarily even the account that is being abusive towards you it's who they might trigger you know it may not be the person that's saying something about me online uh, that is going to punch me in the face if they saw me in a bar but somebody who was maybe slightly uh, more unhinged than they are, maybe wouldn't think twice about it. And I think whenever you're in a public job, that there is, that there is like you know, it's it's not like I'm Lady Gaga. I don't have like 80 million followers or anything like that. But you know, locally, people, some people would know me, or they would talk to me, or you know, you're Amanda from this publication, or from this broadcast, or from Twitter, or from whatever. Uh, so there is a sense that um, you can be communicating with people, and and you know, it often happens to be in taxis where a taxi driver will say to me, and I'm like, is this the point where I have to get out of the car, or are you going to tell me that you know it's all right? And they're like, oh no, you know, I thought you were great on this and that, and then you can relax a little bit. Um, but it's certainly it's it's something that um, seems to increase in intensity. Um, the, the more you share your own actual opinion because, you know, as a journalist, I work as a reporter, but I also work um, doing commentary work and analysis and my own opinion on things. And some people don't seem to understand the difference between the two. You know, I can easily uh, report on a topic and give you all the facts and tell you who said what about, you know, when and, and what's going to happen next. But then I can also say this is what I think about it or this is how I view it. And that seems to be... Um, the the area that that seems to aggravate uh, these kind of people the most. Yeah, I wonder if you, could we bring in Orna here at this point, uh, just when we're talking about the experiences of it, because I think it's important for people who who have no experience of it, you know, for example, me, just to, to to get a sense of of the kind of trolling and and abuse that 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 people can can get that's in the spotlight. Uh, Orna, uh, do you? Baby yeah, thing. no, certainly. Um, I think for me, I'm listening to Amanda with such interest because mm. I, I don't have the following that Amanda has. Um, but at the same time, I certainly 
regulate and mediate my own presence online um as a and uh, you know I'll be really honest as a woman online it's 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 a very different I I I certainly don't invite um I, I definitely how I would put it is that my behavior online is very different um to what you'd probably meet and find me in person because um I don't want to invite I know that as Amanda just said putting an opinion out there um and it can be as something as innocuous as do you say mom, mom or mommy? Um, like something ridiculous like that. And, and I know I'm being flippant using that example, but people will find the, 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 the tiniest thing. And then given, I think, you know, given um, Amanda just said, you know, as a journalist and given my particular background and role, um, you know, people want to get a take on you. They want your opinion so that they can place you and box you. Um, and I don't really give it, you know, I, I kind of... Um, you know, I try and give as little of myself because I don't want to invite. I'm quite, I'm by nature quite a sensitive person. Um, so I it, it wouldn't, but I watch in horror, in absolute horror when I listen, when I say, I listen to, you know, local radio every single day, um, uh, not out of choice work. Um, and uh, I listen to a, a woman politician going on from whatever background and everyone has an opinion on what she said. And a man could go on and say the same thing. So it's not just to make this a, a gender based thing. Like this goes to a much deeper conversation about women in public life and how off putting it is, because I'll be really honest and I don't mind saying, it here i would never go into politics in the north or northern ireland uh for the, on, on that basis alone um because i don't think um it, you know i think anyone who does it is a you know uh, from any political background i think it's incredible then you add in the layers of different um uh, experiences and backgrounds and ethnicities and life experiences people have and you layer that on top of the fact that they're a woman online they may be a woman of color as well you know it, it, this it is quite it is really something that's really remarkable um and i suppose that that's on a very personal level and this was when i spoke earlier i spoke to, uh, you know uh, as someone who has dealt in terms of the you know disinformation and how that is in, absolutely intertwined with the levels of abuse and i know you'll all have seen um, COVID disinformation and how that, you know, th that just the absolute tsunami of abuse people would get for airing a view about a vaccine or uh, a regulation or anything like that. So as Mick said earlier about, you know, everyone has an opinion online and that, you know, it's there's no regulations. Absolutely. Like you can have one single thought in your head and then you just pop on and throw out and I'll tweet um, and I, that that is a problem, um, you know, and uh, with my work hat on, I'm always like, do people stop? before you share anything, before you tweet, just take a step back and take a couple of breathers. I feel like I'm talking to my five-year-old actually. Um, but I think genuinely that is the best advice because sometimes I want to go and I see something and I genuinely think people taking a step back literally would change all of our experiences online. Uh, you don't have to think, tweet every or Instagram update or TikTok, every single thought you have, every minute you have them. So yeah. Well, that, that's an interesting point. Thanks very much, uh, Orna. Uh, make it, 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 that idea of, you know, the idea that, that Twitter and social media can empower people to get that provides a voice to the un underrepresented in society. Do, do, would you see that argument at all? Or uh, uh, Yeah, I think so. Uh, look, I mean, it's self-evident that it gives people a voice. But to what purpose? I mean, for me, that's 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 the issue here. Being able to have a voice, I mean, I can have a voice down the pub and I can say exactly what I like and I can stay legally coherent. I can't destroy my reputation quite in the way that I can if I say some of the same things uh, uh, on Twitter. What I question is, what is the social value ari arising out of people being able to share what actually just comes off the top of their head? Now, to some extent, Amanda's got a point. There are good people on there. I've wanted to delete my Twitter account, but have been reluctant to do it because of the gems that you can find on there. But it's not it, what gets you to the people that you need to listen to or you want to be influenced by. I remember uh, doing some uh, consultancy work a while back, and one of, one of my clients said, you know, really, you should only follow the people that you want to be influenced by. Because by and large, if you see those, it expands your horizon. But 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 this emotion driven thing is actually driving us like lemmings or so or fictitiously supposed to jump off the cliff without even looking for a moment. And Orna's advice is exactly the right kind of advice. 
But the problem with things like Twitter is that it puts no value on five minutes hence or five minutes ago. It only puts value on the the tumult of the moment. And in that, all our yesterdays and all our tomorrows are disappearing from view. And so I think it's it, it may well be giving people a voice, but as I say, to what purpose? And how do we define what our social purposes is? How do, say, to take it right down to the politics of Northern Ireland, how do unionists build something of value that uh, nationalists and Catholics will want to buy into? And how do Republicans get a sufficient number of people to buy into a bigger uh, all island uh, all island future you can't do it on twitter you can't do it by being completely subsumed in in the emotion of now uh, on opinions i think the the problem with opinions i always look there's two things that i think are important opinion is important right but compa- opinions tend to converge They tend to come together around certain kind of schools of ideas and stuff like that. Classic is left and right. In Northern Ireland, we've got nationalists and unionists. But they they sort of polarise, if you like, because at the end of the day, there's only so many simple opinions that anybody can have in one particular argument. But stories, for me, is the thing that we're losing. Journalism is disappearing rapidly. You know, the the local weekly that I grew up was the County Down Spectator in Hollywood. And, you know, my best mate from school worked there for 35 years. He no longer, longer works there because they can no longer afford to pay for someone to go out and get the real human stories of what it is to live in that moment. If you read Malachi O'Doherty's, in my, in my humble opinion, best book that he's ever written, The Telling Year, it's the first year of his... Uh, professional work as a professional journalism at the old Sunday News, which used to be in the newsletter building in uh, Donegal Street. And in there, he describes the way in which that ecosystem of local journalists used to feed in accounts and stories of who we are in our biggest sense. You know, even down to stupid things like the dog drinking the beer and the cultural inn, you know, it's... It, it, it and that is all being pushed out in favor of people who have opinions about things that only simplify the world rather than signify the complexity of what we are. And so, yes, I, I, it is a democratization of expression, but the uh, expression is so individualistic that it doesn't help us to build ourselves as social creatures. And anybody who's had children or intends to have children, who's had children in their lives, they know that this is one of the preoccupations that we have as parents, that we want our kids to come into a better world than the world uh, that we came into. And that's increasingly difficult in a world where only what someone feels in a moment is the only thing that seems to matter. Well, that's a good point just to to then take it. We've already uh, spent the last you know 50 minutes looking at the, at the problems associated with online abuse and, and trolling. And uh, if, if Kieran is, is, is with us, uh, just in the last uh, five minutes or so, we, we get the panel just to see if they can suggest some uh, possible solutions. And we've sort of touched on it during the last 15 minutes or so. Uh, Kieran, uh, what practical solutions do you think could be made uh, to tackle the, this, the problems that you've very helpfully outlined for us tonight? Yeah, I feel like mine was the the doom and gloom portion of this. But one of the things that I, I so often talk about in, in various reports, but every platform has its own version of the problem, is an enforcement gap in between the policies they create to safeguard users and the oft-missed and uh, un- unpracticed policies, as in they're, they're not putting their practices into po- pra- policies into practice. Um, the, and the and that kind of talks about the the structurelessness that even Mick touched upon was that uh, these spaces are created these are artificial spaces that exist online and there are rules put in place but a most people many people don't many people don't follow them they abuse them but even when there are clear and blatant uh, violations of these policies uh, these platforms don't respond and don't act in time and don't mitigate and 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 often they're just they're they're muted towards the uh, so what would need then to 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 force those companies 
Le- legislation is the, is the way forward. I mean, the Irish government's online media safety and media regulation bill, I think have it all out there. And the EU's Digital Services Act are two attempts to address the, the proliferation of, of online, uh, of harmful online content. There's a lot of holes and kind of criticism of these pieces of legislation, but they are uh, important steps in the right direction to kind of touch upon what I mentioned in mind is a systematic approach away from the, the whack-a-mole strategy of, of here's a bad tweet or here's, an un, here's a mis- misleading video towards something that uh, is more systematic, but even, even these pieces of legislation are not perfect. There's no direct complaints mechanism, for example, but it's, it's a step in the right direction. And that's the way that it has to go because ultimately it is uh, it is bringing these platforms to task over these really problematic parts of their platform. Uh, that'll be the only way out of this, the, the most effective and sweeping way out of this. Yeah. Right. So uh, just that, that bit about the complaints then, you, you said that the, the bill wouldn't doesn't address the online complaint system, is that? Yeah, yeah, I, I'm not a policy wonk, so I, I can't get oh, into right. the weeds on this, uh-huh. but uh, the online Irish the Irish bill and I think mm-hmm. the EU one too just won't have an, a direct complaints mechanism, which is something that has been called for uh, time and time again. And even the, the setup of the bill has a what's called a, a country of origin principle, which as far as I understand it, uh, the fact that so many tech companies are based in Dublin, Ireland is their base, which means that uh, Ireland will be the one kind of taking to ta- taking companies to task over most of this. But I mentioned definitions earlier on. Definitions are, are important here again because um, definitions of harmful content based in Irish legislation uh, do not reflect the full uh, expanse of what it may mean in other countries as well, which is a potential pitfall too. Thank you. Just in the last few minutes, we'll go to Orna. Orna, have you any su- suggestions for solutions, things, practical things that we can do to tackle this oh. issue? Well, I think, you know, um, the, you know, social media platforms themselves come in for a lot of flack um, and haven't been inside or, you know, adjacent to a lot of them. There's a lot of good work going on. Um, it may not appear like that, um, but certainly there's a lot of work going on to address issues of abuse. Um, I think a lot of the issue, and I mentioned it earlier, is that issue around transparency. And I also think it's an over-reliance on tech. You know, there's always been this, you know, this idea that there's a solution that we can, you know, algorithm them our way out of this issue but I think it goes much to a, a wider and I think Mick touched upon it in this kind of societal shift we've seen of like that kind of disconnect which I think and not to get too kind of um, existential about it but I think COVID has only exacerbated is that disconnect between actual human beings you know I was in a room with some people for the first time in a long time recently and I do think that uh, what Kieran was saying earlier about that dehumanizing and othering that there is a potential that you can't algorithm your way out of that um and, you know, as I said earlier, in terms of that, you know, I, we've been part of uh, projects to look at that those kind of initiatives. And what I would say is that it comes back to yet again, transparency around we're effectively saying to social media platforms, sure, you go and fix it. Like you sort it out for us. And it goes back to earlier discussion on what is their, what is their, you know, what what is their final point? They they are businesses, so and they make a lot of money out of this type, these type of engagements and people uh, flocking to see this type of stuff. You only have to look at the comment section on our local media news sites on Facebook to see the name, like people, and they're named. Those people are named, and yet they're you know through hurling abuse at each other. So there's a much uh, deeper conversation has to go on here regarding that. As I said. I don't think we can tech our way out of this. I think tech will help um, because it'll identify and it goes back to, I suppose, a conversation about that kind of orchestrated, um, uh, kind of planned out uh, abuse that's happening that, that we witnessed through the COVID-19 pandemic, certainly, uh, and that we, the far right will absolutely uh, exploit to their own ends um, for as long as they need to, um, and th- they will get smarter. Um, so we, we need to have much deeper conversations on that level. I, do, I just think... For me, uh, any of these discussions, you're talking at the level of the individual, you're talking at the level of the tech companies themselves, uh, and then obviously the legal parameters. So it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it is one, I always say, like, information and how we're trading online is one of the is one of the biggest issues of our time. So, um, yeah, I think it's very multi-level. I wish I had a magic wand or a uh, some magic bullet for you, Kieran. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't expect one, now, to be honest, but no no harm to you now, but I didn't expect such a wide subject, a complicated subject that we've come up with, with very succinct problems. It is a 
a multifaceted issue. Uh, very quickly, Amanda, any suggestions? You did talk about that that thing about Twitter that or somebody's yeah. blocked. Uh, yeah, like just yeah. simple things to make it easier yeah. to, to make mm -hmm. the people more accountable online. I think that um, people, some people make the mistake of thinking that social media is the real world, that it's the only thing that exists, that it's representative of the wider community. You know, if, if someone says something nasty to me online, you know, nobody uh, in Bangor or in Jordanstown or in, in, you know, any other part has seen it. If you went out into the street, nobody would know what was being said. So I think that it's good. The internet is good for entertainment and for information. Um, it helps with isolation, a sense of community. It's good for activism. Um, it's also good for romance uh, in certain uh, sections, but also... We have to remember that newspapers and uh, television and radio doesn't have the same um, reach uh, that it used to. It certainly still is very popular and will continue to be, but the online world is here to stay. So we need to uh, go with the legislation. We need to educate people. We need to change who is a publisher um, and we need to have accountability. But yes, if I had the magic uh, wand, I would just sort of zip people's mouths or <laughs> stop them from being able to type. But uh, that's I, I don't have that one just yet, but it's 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 global. It's huge. Like it's, yeah. it's something that we're going to be wrestling with for a long time. Thank you. And, and finally, Mick, just very quick su suggestions. Do you think, or do they exist? Well, I think there's a way of looking at these big tech companies as uh, environmental polluters, uh, and there's a principle in environmental law that the polluters should pay. I, I I talked earlier about the importance of the ancient, now it feels like an ancient importance of regional newspapers. Those regional newspapers tried to make their peace with Facebook, uh, particularly, and they lost that battle and they lost their revenues and they lost their capacity to uh, employ good local journalists who knew the community, who understood the, the virtues of the community and sell that back to them. I think we need more stories. And Facebook will never pay for good stories. It'll only uh, provoke people into telling the worst kind of stories. And I think the example of this is Amanda's story about the taxi driver getting into the back of a taxi, uh, feeling got at by the online world. And, say, and, and the truth is people face to face are decent because that's the human space in which we rehumanize ourselves. So I think polluter pays. I think they've got to. Uh, we've got to be stronger as as a society and turn around to these global behemoths that are denuding us of uh, our right to tell our own stories of the better selves that we can be, uh, and 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 make sure that that money is redistributed where it will have the best effect. Well, listen. Thank you all. Uh, I think it's fair to say that we did scratch the surface of the debate. It is a multifaceted issue. Uh, I want to thank everybody. Amanda, Kieran, Mick and, and Orna, to all those watching us live and streamed and those that, that, that can watch it again, thank you very much indeed. Uh, to Richard and Amanda, the Accidental Theatre, to uh, Peter O'Neill at the Imagine Belfast Festival, and again to everyone. So thank you all very much indeed, and I'll see you the next time. Good night. <laughs>